Oh, you can hear me? <laughs> I was trying to pretend. Okay. How many of you guys didn't fall for it? All right. First last, man, I'm glad you came here. I forgot to send the text out to you and and Protestant to let you know. Sorry about that, man. I've been running around. 1611 on your way to heaven, bro. Where you been? I didn't know you're going live. You didn't know? Okay, maybe you did la later, right? You meant didn't know. In the middle of reminding a Bible. Hey, I like your English first last. I didn't know you're going and you're reminding a Bible. What are you reminding the Bible of? Are you reminding the Bible of those lost books? Yeah, so what's up, 1611 on your way to heaven? You've been listening to at least the uh, archived? The great Trinitarian exegete. I don't know. Pray a little. Uh, pray right now. I was going to say a little bit. We need to be praying a lot. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to show up in a miraculous, majestic way and to fill us and to refresh us and rejuvenate us, replenish us for the glory of Jesus Christ. Just a little down today because the weather where I'm at, it's like about to rain. It's like gloomy, right? And but. Two more days, it will be my daughter's birthday, my oldest. She's going to turn 10, so a little gloomy for me. But we love the Father. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, and we love the Holy Spirit, and we're trusting in the mercy, the compassion, the grace, the love, the pity of the Father and of the Son, our God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit to just fill us and show up, right? So we're going to wait a few more minutes for the regulars to show up, and there's a lot of meat there's a lot of unpacking, a lot of defi defining and explaining to do. We're trusting the majestic, glorious, sovereign, triune God. We're trusting the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Savior, the Father's heart, his beloved. We're trusting the glorious, beautiful Holy Spirit to protect me from all error, confusion, to constrain me from misinformation, to speak clearly and accurately, to recall scriptures correctly and interpret them perfectly, by the power of the Holy Spirit, for the glory of Jesus Christ, to bring honor and praise to the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to bless you with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit fills us, seals us, sanctifies us, perfects us, and transforms us to conform to the image of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we need you. We don't just need you for these live streams, Father. I don't just need you when I teach or I write or I preach. Father, we need you. And this is a fact. It is truth, completely true. We need you every second, every minute, <clears throat> every moment of our existence. The breath we breathe is from your gra grace. <clears throat> the life we have is from your grace. Our ability to speak, our ability to move, our ability to be in motion, is from your grace, your love, your compassion, and union with your Son, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus, <clears throat> along with your Holy Spirit. So, Father, we need you. We need you every second, every minute. Even in those moments when we fail you, Father, we still need you. So, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, first forgive us, Father, for failing you. We ask that you save us from our own flesh, our sinful passions, our carnal desires, Crucify our flesh every day by the power of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit to crucify our flesh and <clears throat> remove all the stain of our flesh and the fruit of the flesh. And Father, in the name of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the sake of your beloved Son, to glorify him, to honor him, to love him, not to shame him. Save us from our flesh and our wretchedness and give us power from your Spirit to be filled with fruit from the Spirit, life from your Holy Spirit, wisdom from your Holy Spirit, understanding from your Holy Spirit, knowledge from your Holy Spirit, self-control, self-restraint, self-constraint, self-discipline from your Holy Spirit, Father, please. Seal us by your Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ to never shame you, to never dishonor you, Father. And Father, save me from my imperfections and weaknesses, not to be a stumbling block and not to allow others to cause me to stumble and grieve your Spirit, Father. Take over this session, Father. Lord Jesus, take over this session. Increase in us, Lord Jesus. Sit and throne upon our hearts. Purify our hearts in your holy blood, Lord Jesus. And purify the hearts of our family members who don't know you and even those who know you. 
And in my case, my daughters, even their mother, purify their hearts in your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Sit and throne upon their hearts, Lord Jesus, and seal them by your spirit and flood them and flood us in your love, Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, take over the session. Guide me, please, to make no mistakes, no error, even minor ones. And enable me to recall the facts and, and the knowledge and information to do justice to this topic. Trusting in you to guide this conversation and illuminate them, Holy Spirit. Open their eyes and their hearts and their minds to go deeper into the word of God. To know God more intimately. To love God more passionately and obey him more perfectly. And if necessary, to die for our God. Give us that grace, Holy Spirit. We need you, Father. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. Save us from attacks of the children of Satan. Surround us with a wall of fire from the Holy Spirit. Surround my children with a wall of fire from the Holy Spirit. And cover us and shield us by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our loved ones, those who are saved or not saved, that they will be saved and trust in Jesus. Whether our parents, our siblings, our spouses, our children, in my case, my children, and even their mother, to fear the Lord Jesus and return to Christ. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name, Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah, Holy Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. Glory to Jesus Christ. The internet connection has become practically flawless. It's perfect because I've connected to the modem. I'm not using the internet, the ethernet, right? So hopefully, again, I feel weak. I feel drained, but my trust is in the Holy Spirit and the strength and the energy from the Holy Spirit. So I'm trusting in him to take over for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? So it's called ethernet, right? Ethernet, ethernet. I don't know what's amazing, Cass. Our God is amazing, yes. Ethernet. All right. We'll wait a few more minutes to begin. As you can see, the title is The Doctrine of the Trinity Explained. I just saw something fall from me. What was that? Was that hair? I went like this and I saw some fall. I hope the, co this, uh, the connection is good. The picture is clear. Is the picture clear? Is the picture clear or not? And it kind of scared me, bro. HD quality. Yep. Uh, Jesus is my God, too. I don't know. You're scaring me. God bless you guys for your love and support. Praise the Lord Jesus for putting your hearts to want to bless us financially to do the ministry. The Lord Jesus richly bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, everyone. Okay, what's the question? I hope it's not a question that's going to deter me off the topic. Desh, how are you, friend? And by the way, as we're waiting, because I just wait a few more minutes, well, glory to God, our numbers are increasing. And again, may he sanctify my heart, save me from hypocrisy, from false sense of humility and humbleness and pride and arrogance, to purify my motives for the glory of Jesus. I want more people to come so that they can be blessed by the Spirit through these sessions in Jesus' name. Looking forward to this. Okay, I was going about to say something. Yeah, remember, here are some rules to remind you. Everyone, I want to remind you of the rules because it's worth repeating. Help me to help you so I don't stumble and then cause you to stumble and cause me to sin and cause you to sin. Do not pontificate, meaning do not come here and speak <clears throat> In an authoritative manner, do not start side conversations and going into tangents to distract people. Do not ask me questions not related to the topic. Work with me because I got issues. I'm easily distracted. I lose focus. Help me until I overcome those issues by the grace of God so I don't become a stumbling block to others because those others are here because they want to hear a topic. When someone comes and starts speaking with authority as if he knows the subject and I know he's wrong or she's wrong, then I'm tempted to correct that person like I did to someone in the comment section who had no idea what dual prophecy meant. Even though I corrected him in his pride and arrogance, he still had to pontificate. Help me to help you. This is not a debate session. You want to set up a debate, set up a debate. I've told you, set up a debate, I'll come. This is a little session where I'm... Trusting the Holy Spirit to use me to teach you what I know. And the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth and save you from any mistakes on my part. And correct those mistakes in me not to repeat them. Because I don't have perfect knowledge. So if you follow those rules, you will benefit and you'll be blessed. I don't want you to believe everything I believe. I want you to hear me out. Re-listen to the sessions. Take notes. Go back and study. 
hear another opinion, and if you're convinced I'm wrong, amen. There are people I listen to I don't agree with. I think they're wrong, but I still listen to them. And I know that their channel is not open up for a debate session. Our precious brother in Jesus Christ, Christian Prince, his live streams are for debates. He opens up his Skype and invites Abduls and Potatoes. Potato, Abdul, 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 Abdul. To call in because he wants them to call in so he can decimate their religion, expose Muhammad as the son of Satan, the false prophet, and Allah as Satan. Right? So you see what Jesus and my God did, right? I don't know what to say. Folks, he just asked me a question that I've answered maybe over a dozen times on my YouTube channel. I just did a session on this question maybe a couple weeks ago, and I have over a dozen articles on this question. And I just asked, do not ask me a question that will get off the topic, and he just did that. Folks, you know, if I answer this question on Jesus not knowing the their hour, you know, I won't get into the topic. You know that, right? So is he respecting me and respecting you by asking me that question? When he knows what the topic is? Help me understand, because maybe I'm making it more than it is. Uh, which part of you? Yeah, brother, you got to go. I'm sorry, bro. So I love you. You know that. I don't take this personally, but you got to go. Send him out of here, because notice his response now. You're causing me to stumble, brother. Lord, forgive me and forgive you. God bless you, brother. Okay. Yeah. Let me add a fourth rule. Can I add a fourth rule? Okay. Hopefully it will get better. We'll be blessed and we won't anger the Holy Spirit. Here's the fourth rule. The fourth rule. Before you ask me to answer a question, okay, make sure you're not lazy you go to my YouTube channel, search to see if I've already done a session or two or more on that question, or go to the website, answeringislam.net, check out individual authors. I have two pages where my articles are listed. See if I've answered it in those articles, or go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. First, make sure you've done your homework and you're not lazy and you want me to spoon feed you like a baby. See if I've answered that. Then if you don't find the answer, ask me, especially if you've done a thorough search and you can't find it. But don't ask me during the session where I have to change the focus of the topic. All right. Are we now ready? Anika, uh, believe me, it's, it's not the love of Christ. It's me constraining my flesh, Anika. It's me begging the Holy Spirit to crucify my flesh because I'm weak here. And the demons that are working through human beings, not Jesus is my God. I'm not saying him. God have mercy on him. But there are humans being used of demons, of Satan. They know what my weakness is and they want to keep pricking me so I can lose my testimony so they can get Christians to turn against me. I know. I know their strategy. So I beg the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus so that Jesus won't be shamed, constrain me and crucify my flesh and take over. Because I, I can't do it. I'm weak. And don't tell me there isn't a person here who is weak in a certain area that you struggle to overcome. If you don't have any weaknesses, you're already in heaven or you're a liar. Right? All right Mary, you here? Everyone here? Okay, I guess we're ready. I was just giving a few moments for the regulars to show in. So uh, to show up. Show in may, as Holy Spirit. Protect me from Aaron stammering. Please, Holy Spirit. So you guys got the rules, right? You got the rules? Everyone got the rules, right? Even my precious brother, Mike A.D., I guess I had blocked him a while back, but God bless his humble, gracious servant heart. He appealed to me in love to restore him, and I did. God bless him, see? And he's benefiting, I'm hoping, right, Mike? And he's got a powerful testimony. He's got a YouTube channel. Guys, hit, hit up his YouTube channel, subscribe to it. He's got his testimony how Jesus Christ did a miracle in his life, and saved him in a miraculous way. What's up, DJ Next? Yay, yay. All right. Everyone ready? You know who I'm not seeing anymore? Where is Anna Groong? G-R-O-O-N-G. Did she abandon me? I hope she didn't turn against me. Now, uh-oh. 
We're buffering now. There goes. There goes my connection. It's over. Where is she? We're buffering now. Hopefully, we won't buff, buff as much. It buffs once in a while. Anyway, Anna may be listening. I hope. Oh, there she go. There you go. Anna, you know you're a, mir a miracle, right? Anna Groong, G R O O N G. I just said, where is the sister? She's gone. She disappeared. And bam, you, pop you know you're an angel. Guys, do you want proof she's an angel? That she's an angel in human disguise, pretending to be a woman? She's actually an angel? You know she appears from heaven and disappears. Tell me, how in the world could she just show up right after me asking, where is Anna Groong? Bam, she shows up. Wow, Anna. You now prove to me you are an angel in human guise. Smeller, ask me if I'm an Arab one more time, and I'm going to send you somewhere where you can smell all day and all night, and it ain't going to be paint fumes, okay? You are proof, Anna, that angels can walk among us in human form. Because once I said, where's Anna? Where's the sister? Oh, she's not angry at me. And Lord bless her. Bam, she showed up. See, you were in heaven, and you heard. Sam's asking for you, and you're here. Wow, Anna. Wow! All right, are we ready now? You just showed up out of nowhere. Okay, are we now ready? Okay, guys. Guys, please help me to help you. Do not get into side talks, into tangents or debates. Don't pontificate and help me to explain something. Don't quote verses. Let the mods quote verses, right? Don't ask questions not related to the topic. Ask questions that are related to the topic so you can benefit because this is going to be the go-to session. Anytime someone asks me, how do we explain the Trinity? By the grace of Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus willing, this will be the session. Here, go listen. Here, go listen. So I won't have to explain this over and over and over again. Everyone with me? In Jesus' name, give me your ears. Trust the Spirit to, to use this session to glorify the triune God. Okay, are you with me there? Okay, this is going to be the go-to session. Okay, I'm not buffering. Malika, it's your computer. We're not buffering here. Am I okay? Okay, can you send Sneller out of here, please? Can you get him out of here? The snake, this demon? Get him out of here, please. Okay. Guys, get him out of here, please. You see he's distracting. He's not listening. Okay, focus now. Okay, now, please, I need your attention because this is a very important topic. Okay. Notice it's the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I need to define what do we mean by the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity, the teaching of the Trinity, refers to the language that Christian scholars and theologians use to try to accurately explain what the Bible teaches. The doctrine of the Trinity is not the same as the biblical evidence for the Trinity. You with me there? And I'm trusting the Spirit to protect me from error. What do I mean? The teaching of the Trinity is the explanation set forth by uninspired human vessels, imperfect, finite, uninspired human vessels, who are using language to try to accurately describe what the Bible teaches, but not in the language of the Bible. Using language other than the language found in the Bible to express accurately what the Bible teaches. Are you with me for now, so far? This is, this, is the, this is important. This is important. This is where Christians get confused and anti-Trinitarians deceitfully, dishonestly, right? <laughs> Try to get Christians to stumble on this point. And if you're not understanding, ask me to clarify because I'm not going to go fast. I'm going to go as slow as possible until it becomes second nature by the grace of God's spirit. And if I have to do a part two, I'll do a part two. Okay, now, 
The difference between the doctrine of the Trinity and the biblical basis for the Trinity is this. The doctrine of the Trinity refers to the language, the words that uninspired, meaning Christian scholars and theologians, apologists who are not inspired by the Spirit as the authors of the Bible were inspired by the Spirit, came up with language that they used to try to accurately describe what the Bible teaches about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to the best of their abilities. Everyone want me there? Did you get what, I, what I'm saying here? Therefore, when you hear an anti-Trinitarian say to you, the Bible doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity, he or she is either being ignorant or dishonest because by the doctrine of the Trinity, what they mean is the Bible does not use that language that later theologians, <clears throat> scholars, <clears throat> apologists of the church came up with to describe what they find in the Bible. Don't fall for that trap. Don't be duped and deceived and fall for that snare because no one is saying that the Bible uses the language that later Christians, the, you know, theologians, apologists, and scholars came up with to accurately describe what the Bible teaches. You with me? The Bible is not a manual of systematic theology. It's not a systematic theology book, a primer on systematic theology. The Bible are <clears throat> a collection of books inspired by the Spirit through human authors <clears throat> to tell us about God's <clears throat> acts in time and space, how the true God of all creation entered time and space to interact with his creatures and make himself known to them on a personal <clears throat> experiential level. Right? It's not a book of systematic theology where you can turn to a specific book of the Bible and it'll say the Trinity and focus entirely on the Trinity. That's not the purpose of the Bible. So if someone were to tell me, point, point to that one specific book of the 66 books or 73 books if you're Roman Catholic or 81, right? You get the point. Where it talks about the Trinity in great detail. There is no one book that does that. Because the Bible is not written that way. See, if I pick, pick up a book on systematic theology, let's say by Will, Wayne Grudem or Miller J. Erickson, it has a section called Trinity. It has a section called Jesus Christ, Christology. The Bible is not written as a book of systematic theology. How do we arrive at the Trinity? By reading the Bible in toto, and reading the Bible in context to see what the Bible in its totality, in toto says, about Jesus, about the Spirit, about the Father, about God, about the nature of God, the attributes of God. But no one book plunges in great detail on these topics. You will find Isaiah talking about the characteristics of God and saying something about the Messiah or the Spirit, but no one book, no one author spends a whole book on just explaining a particular doctrine like the Trinity or Christology or the two nature. No one does that. Is that clear? Am I confusing you? I hope not, and I'm trusting the Spirit to anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. So differentiate, make a distinction, make a distinction between the doctrine of the Trinity and the biblical basis for the Trinity. What the Bible teaches about the Trinity and the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity refers to that language that Christians throughout the ages, throughout centuries, came up with to try to explain to the best of their abilities, their imperfect, fallible abilities, what the Bible says about the Godhead as accurately as humanly possible. 
And just to correct even my mod, Protestant believer, no, chapter 4, verse 171 does not talk about the Trinity. It doesn't use the word Trinity, and it's not about the Trinity. Just have to correct even my mod here. Say I'm an equal opportunist. I correct everyone. Okay, so if you're with me on that first point, let's move on to the second point. What is the doctrine of the Trinity? What is the doctrine of the Trinity? Okay, is everyone with me here? I'm going to go very slow, and I'm going to unpack it step by step because if you don't get it, it defeats the purpose. So I'm trusting the Holy Spirit will enable me to be successful and illuminate you to get it. The doctrine of the Trinity is the language we use to describe the Trinity. For instance, being and persons, right? When we talk about the being of God and the persons of God, one what, three who's. Or when we talk about Christ possessing two natures, hypostatic union, theanthropos, the God-man, two hypostases, meaning two natures in one person. All of that language, if you press me to show you that precise vocabulary, that precise exact language in the Bible, I can't do it. It's not there. Not hypothesis, hypostasis, hypostasis. You see? Now, before I get into explaining and defining the terms that Christians came up with in articulating the doctrine of the Trinity, <clears throat> I have to be clear that the words I use will only work in the English language. What do I mean? Because I'm an English speaker and you're English speakers, I'm going to use appropriate words that only work for English speakers, which may not work in another language. Because I'm speaking to English speakers, the terms I use will be accurate and appropriate in accurately defining the Trinity in the English language. But it doesn't necessarily transfer over to Arabic or Coptic or Aramaic or Latin. Everyone with me there? Therefore, if English is not your mother tongue, let's say Arabic is, you would have to find a Christian theologian whose mother tongue is Arabic or knows Arabic on a scholarly level to explain in Arabic the language that Arabic theologians coined to describe the Trinity. That I can't do for you. I don't know all languages. I don't know Assyrian too well. I hardly know English. I'm going to do my best to stick with English because that's the language I use to teach, write, preach, and debate. With me there? Is, are you getting these two points before I move on? Because if you try to translate some of these terms in a target language, you may miscommunicate. I'm going to give you an example for you Arabic speakers. For those of you who speak Arabic, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. In English, if I say the word person, an Arabic speaker would translate the word person as shahs. Shahs. That's the Arabic word for person in English. Shahs. Okay? Everyone with me there? Shahs. Now, for untrained Arabic speakers, meaning those who are not trained in, trained in the theology or philosophy, when you say shahs, shah means a finite, temporal, imperfect person. And that's the word used to describe an imperfect, finite, limited, flesh and blood human being. So to say that the father is a person in Arabic would mean that ab, the Arabic word for father, is a shaks. And an Arabic-speaking Christian or an Arabic-speaking Muslim will say, stuck for Allah. He's not a shaks. How would you dare say that Allah is a shaks or the father? You get my point now? Is it making sense? 
So although the English word person is appropriate, that doesn't mean translating the word person into another language would be correct and the precise way of explaining the doctrine of the Trinity. See, so guys, here you're going to get educated. This session, you may not be excited, entertained, but you will get an education by the grace of the triune God. So if you're one of those who wants to be entertained and two-minute sound bites, I'm going to lose you. But if you're serious students of the word and you hunger for the depth of the word, hunger for the depth of God, then you will be blessed. I promise you in Jesus' name. Uh, Eugene, you got to go. You know that, right? Get Eugene out of here too. No respect for me or the other Christians or for the God that we came to serve. Get him out of here. Okay. Captain, don't unhide him. Hide him. Talking about nonsense. Okay. So everyone following with me, right? So let me repeat. The doctrine of the Trinity is not the same as the biblical evidence for the Trinity or the biblical foundation for the Trinity. And the words I will use to explain the Trinity will only work for English speakers. Now, I can't help you if you speak another language. That's why ask the Holy Spirit to guide you to a person who speaks your language fluently and who knows the doctrine of the Trinity in your language to articulate it correctly. Clear? Okay, if that's clear, now we can talk about the doctrine. The doctrine of the Trinity is basically the teaching that there's only one eternal being of God. Here's now I'm going to explain terms, right? And by the way, one of the one of the best books on this, it has an entire chapter on this. One second. It has an entire chapter on this. Let me get it. One second. You got to get this book. I was supposed to bring it next to me in the live stream. Is it next to me? Hold on. Guys, sorry. It's a live stream. Yeah. I. This is why I've said it, and I'll say it again. I know you can hear me. Sorry, live stream, folks. Uh, you need to get this book. If, if you can't afford it, go to the library. Ask them to get it for you and just, you know, loan it out. This book here, The Forgotten Trinity by Dr. James R. White. I've said it, and I'll say it again. This is one of the best primers on the Trinity. It is great for the beginning and intermediate stages of, of Christians. If you're in the beginning stage, this book is for you. Okay. What makes this book outstanding? He has a chapter on defining these terms, being and persons. So thank the Lord Jesus for Dr. James R. White's excellent primer on the Trinity. See, God is beautiful, and he raises up his soldiers, his servants in all ages, and gives them the power of the Spirit to articulate the truths of the Bible and refute those who oppose them, right? This one you need to read. It even has a section on the essential attributes of God in order to then use that to demonstrate the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they're not one person. So get this. It's not buffering here, Remy. It's not buffering for me. Don't forget it. The Forgotten Trinity, Dr. James R. White. Okay, get that book. I've said it, I'll say it again. This is one of the best books, if not the best book, for those who are in the beginning or intermediate stages of their Christian walk. Okay? So what I'm going to say here, he's, he covers in the book. He covers in the book. Okay. The Doctrine of the Trinity teaches... That there's one eternal being of God, and there are three eternal persons that possess the being of God. See, now I have to unpack that, right? Okay, let me repeat again. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches there is one eternal being of God, and there are three eternal per persons who possess the being of God. Okay, so if you got that, I got to explain my language now. Now I got to define terms. Yeah, it's... Sarah, it's been updated. It the, there's an older version of this with a different cover. It's been updated. Here we go. Hater Wood, who's a neophyte when it comes to apologetics and 
couldn't articulate the Trinity if his salvation depended on it, spying in on our freedom to report back to his overlords. We still love your hater, Wood, and I'll still carry you till the day I die. Great is my reward for carrying weight like you, hater, Wood. Don't hate, participate. Okay, now with that said, we love Hater Wood. Do you know why Hater Wood exists? Because he teaches you what not to do and what not to be as a Christian. See, some people are raised up to show you this is how you're supposed to act. Others are raised up to show you that's what you don't want to become and you don't want to act like this. David Wood exists to show us that's not what you do. That's not how you behave. You don't want to be that. So thank him for the sacrifice of showing us what we aim not to be like. Thank you, Hater Wood. All right. Still love you, bro. Okay, now with that said, let's focus. Okay. There's one eternal being of God and three persons that possess the eternal being of God. Okay. Now, Fred sent, what was it? Okay. Reverse. You know you're confusing people when you say three persons in hypostasis, right? Because the theological technical term that the Greek fathers used for person was hypostasis, right? So now, do, guys, do I need to repeat the rules again? I'm, I wasn't clear, was I? Can I repeat the uh, rules again? Okay, here we go. All right, everyone with me here? Let's focus. Everyone with me here? Focus, right? Let me now explain the terms. What do we mean by one eternal being of God and three eternal persons? Okay. Why am I distinguishing the term being from person? Okay. The term being refers to the state in which someone or something exists. Your state of existence. Let me repeat it again. Being refers the state, the condition in which something or someone exists. In other words... Everything everyone has being. For example, this book has being. It has a state of existence. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to hold it in my hand, right? But we have to be careful. When we talk about God's being, God's being is not physical. It's not spatial. It's not material. It simply means a state of existence. You have a state of existence. Your state of existence is that of humanity. A chair has a state of existence. It has being. Rock has a state of existence. It has being. So when you talk about being, you're talking about the existence of a thing or a person, the state in which a thing or person exists. You understand the term now? Being simply means existence, the way something or someone exists. Brad Egan, please don't. Help me to help others. Don't help me. We're going to get to that. We know Jesus has a physical body. Just sit and listen, brother. You don't want to be sent on your merry way. Benefit, dude. Yeah. Dawood, David Wood, do you want me to embarrass you and show you that your filthy dog of a prophet, Muhammad, couldn't even explain Tawheed and you can't do any better? Do you want me to embarrass you and your prophet? Do you have the guts to answer a question for me so I can make an example of you? That only demons follow Muhammad, the son of Satan? Let's see if this coward will come to the honor of his prophet. I just insult your prophet. Let's see you're going to defend him. Hold on, guys. We got to muzzle the Muhammadan dogs for the glory of Jesus. If not, I'm going to send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone. You ready, Dawood David Wood? Ibn Shaytan, Ibn Muta? Let's see if you have the courage to come to the honor of your prophet. See, he won't do it. Okay, He won't do it. Ibn Muta. No, it's not easy one God. Because I want you to explain to me, are you one of these munafic hypocrites? Do you believe the Quran is the eternal word of Allah, the kalam of Allah? Is it uncreated or is it created? Ya kafir, ya munafik, Ibn Muta. Come on, answer, answer. Come on, boy. I have a black stone for you to lick. Come on, come on, boy. <laughs> Is the Quran eternal, uncreated? See, if the mods were to do a quicker job of getting ready the nuisances, we wouldn't have to be distracted. But don't block them now. See if they're quicker. Okay. Come on, girl. 
Come on. I got a black stone for you, girl. Yeah, I had a girl. Fetch it. Yeah. He's not going to answer because he's scared. Because even his prophet couldn't answer. That's why he murdered people. Okay, now send him on his merry way. Send him on his merry way, guys. Come on, admins. Uh, mods, I love you guys. When you see a troll, get rid of him for the sake of the Christians. Okay. Do you love that? Come on, girl. I got a black stone. There, there, girl. Here, fetch. Fetch the black stone. Smooch it. Smoochy, smoochy. And I don't mean to insult dogs, honestly. Dogs are beautiful animals, and they're faithful and loyal, unlike Muhammad and his followers. So I hope dogs won't get angry at me. And on the day of judgment, I won't have a line of dogs standing in judgment against me saying, how dare you insult us by comparing us to these people? I'm sorry. I love you guys. All right. Anyway, so you understand what the term being means now? Do you understand what the term being means? Do you understand what the term being means? Being means existence. The state in which something or someone exists, your existence, the way you exist, how you exist. See, so I say, Sai Christian has being. What kind of being? He has the being of humanity. He's a human being. He exists as a human. That's the state of existence. Everyone got the term. Mary, you got the term? Everyone understood? Louisa, you understood? You got the term? You understand the meaning of the term? Now, if you understand the meaning of the term, here's something that's common sense to everyone. Not every being is personal. Not everything that has being has personhood. So you can have something that has being but is not a person. For example, my bottle has being but it's not a person. Right? This cap has being. It's not a person. This book has being. It's not a person. My chair has being. It's not a person. So differentiate between being and person. Everything that exists has being, has existence. But not everything that exists has personhood, is personal, has personality. Did that make sense? You with me there? Rational phobia. Brother, be patient. For the love of the triune God, you want me to rush? My goodness, dude. I'm sorry that you're smarter than us and you're catching fast, but we're slow. Slow down, bro. Calm down. <laughs> Get off that horse. <laughs> oh, horsey. Okay. So we've just established being is not the same as person. That is... Foundation number one in the doctrine of the Trinity. Distinguish between being and person. Being is not the same as person. In the doctrine of the Trinity, when we speak of being, being we mean, we define it, we mean something different by the term person. So foundation number one, differentiate between being and person. The being of God is one. So now let's go to the second foundation. The second foundation is there are three eternal persons that possess the one being of God. Okay, so now let's define the term person in reference to God. Are we, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready now? You sure? Okay. All glory to the triune God. If I'm successful, the triune God gets the glory for it. If you're understanding, thank the Holy Spirit for allowing you, enabling you to understand. Okay. By person, in reference to the Father, in reference to the Son, in reference to the Holy Spirit, I do not mean, here's where you're going to have to now erase this from your mind, or include a further definition. Because when I said person to a human being, what he's thinking of is, oh, a flesh and blood human being. No. No. By person, I mean the Father can speak and be spoken to. The Father has awareness. He's aware that he exists. And he's aware that others exist. 
The father has emotions. The father has a will, volition. The father has a mind. So by person, in reference to the members of the Godhead, I do not mean the father is a flesh and blood, finite human person. That's not how I'm defining the term person. The term person in reference to the Godhead means the father has emotions. He loves. He gets angry. He, he, he gets hurt. He gets disappointed. He has a desire. He has a volition. He has will. He has a mind. He has thoughts. He has cogn cognition. He's aware. He aware. He's aware that he exists. He's aware of his own existence. He's aware that other exist. That's what I mean by person. Right? Let me repeat again. Not every being has personhood because this bottle is not aware. It doesn't have awareness. It doesn't know it exists. Right? It doesn't have feelings. So when I hit it, it doesn't feel pain. When I hit it, it doesn't say, ouch, and yell at me or talk to me. Right? You get my point? Rob. Allahu Akbar. Dogs have emotions. So are you a dog, Rob? Cats have emotions. So are you a pussy cat? A kitten? Why? You know I have anger issues. I'm impatient. And you know Christians attack me for that. And they say I'm not a Christian. They don't see Jesus in me and I'm a fake. And you know Muslims are using it against me. So why am I teaching? Can I get a job as an IT in some major corporation? Make about six figures so I can go to Hawaii and shut this down and go live in a mountain there? Why? I don't have patience. Please forgive me. Okay, you with me there? Okay, everyone got it now? So you understand, you can have being but not personhood. You can have being but not personhood. So again, my cat, my bottle, they have being, they exist. But if I start talking to my cap and bottle, you're going to call Bellevue. For example, if I say, shut up! Don't you dare talk back to me. You don't taste too good today. Oh, really? Yeah? You're going to call Bellevue. Right? And if I pick up my book and I say, stop looking at me that way. You better smile now. You know you're all caps. And that means you're being loud. Shut your voice. You right? You get my point now? Okay. You understand now the difference between being and person? Does everyone understand the difference between being and person? And by the way, Marika, it's not L-M-A-O. We don't say laugh my aspirations off. We say laugh my butt off, right? Okay. Now, so now going back to the father. The father is a person, but he's not a flesh and blood human being. The father is a person in this sense. He has emotions. That's why the father can love you or the father can hate you or the father can be displeased with you or the father can be grieved and sad and hurt. So he's a person in the sense that he has emotions. He has awareness. The father knows he's the father. He knows he exists. He has knowledge. He has understanding. He has a mind. He has a will. He has a volition. That's what I mean when I say the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, Jesus becomes unique in that not only is he a divine person, he then took on a human nature and became a human being, but still remained one person. And that's a future talk. Right now, I want to focus on the members of the Godhead, the divine persons. The Father is a person. The Son is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Okay, the son is an eternal divine person. The father is an eternal divine person. The Holy Spirit is an eternal divine person. So do you understand that now? What do we mean by the doctrine of the Trinity? The doctrine of the Trinity teaches there's one eternal being of God. And yet there are three persons that possess this being that have eternally existed as God. Their existence has been eternally God. In other words, they exist as God. 
the state in which they exist is the state of God, being God. Right? Three. So they are not the same person. They are different persons, which is why the Father can speak to the Son. The Son can speak to the Father, which is why the Father and the Son can instruct the Spirit, and the Spirit speak to the Father and the Son, which is why the Father can love the Son and the Spirit. The Spirit loved the Son and the Father, and the Son loved both, because they're not the same person. They're different persons who are aware that the other two exist. So the father is aware, that's my son, he's not me. That's my spirit, and he's not my son. And the son is aware, that's the spirit, that's the father. They're not me, I'm not them. We are different, but we are one God. Oh, my goodness. Cloudy, can I block you for that? This guy, uh, Cloudy, dude. My goodness, this guy didn't get it at all. Three eternal beings in one personhood. Yeah, this guy totally lost it. Hey, can you throw him off of Discord too? Because when I come back, I want to block him from Discord. Guys, did you see how he actually got the opposite point? Did I say three eternal beings, one personhood? Or did I say three persons, one being? Wow. Wow. Guys, who's not getting it before I move on? Before I move on? Fred, Cloudy has no language. He has no language. Right? He's just learning as he goes along, and he's adapting all languages because he has none. He's adopting the Jeet Kune Do of languages. You know, Bruce Lee says, having no style as style, having no way as way. You know? he's He has no language. So he can speak all languages because he's languageless. All right. Who didn't get it? Who didn't get it? Okay. You understand the difference between being and person? Being and person. Being is existence, the state of existence, the state in which someone or something exists. Person refers to a thing that has awareness, self-aware, has emotions, volition, can speak and be spoken to, knowledge and wisdom. That's what I mean. So by person, I don't mean the father is a flesh and blood human being, human person. The son is a flesh and blood human being. Even though he took on a nature, a human nature later, here I'm talking about Jesus as divine. The divine son before creation, before he became flesh, an eternal person. The Holy Spirit is a person. So one being, three persons possessing that one being eternally, possessing that being completely. The father fully exists as God. The son fully exists as God. The spirit fully exists as God. They possess the being of God in all its fullness. Whatever makes God God. Each three, or all three, I should say, possess every essential quality and characteristic that makes up the being, being of God, and they possess it fully, equally, eternally. But they're not the same person. Clear? They're not the same person. So where does the confusion set in? The confusion sets in... When we try to imagine God's being and his existence and his reality <clears throat> to the way creation exists. In other words, here's where people get confused. Because we are creatures bound to time, space, and place, and because we interpret everything through the lens of our creatureliness, through our created existence, to us, if you are one being, you have to be one person. Because in our frame of reference, in our created reality, in our created experience, in the created order, we do not typically see a being that's more than one person. So this is where we get confused. Well, hold on. If you're one being, you got to be one person. You see where the confusion comes in, right? Do you see where the confusion comes in? 
The reason why we get confused and we can't fathom how God can be one and three persons is because we're filtering everything through our created reality, from our frame of reference, from the created order, from the created realm. So in creation, I don't see a being that's more than one person, right? And because I don't see that, my mind thinks if you're one being, you got to be one person because every being is a single person. Every person is a single being, right? So then we take our frame of reference, our cre created <clears throat> reality, our creatureliness, and then <clears throat> impose that on God and think that God, for him to be one God, has to exist the same way I exist. And that's where we get into problems. That's where we get into problems. You understand? No, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Woo, these rules people can't follow. The shack is one of the greatest assaults on the Trinity. What are you talking about? The shack did a good job? You insult me when you say that. Guys, can you stop commenting and say stuff like this? The shack is an abomination to the Trinity. It is a horrendous blasphemy against the Trinity. The fact that you think it's a good analogy tells me you do not know the Trinity. And you need to repent of that. It's a movie based on a book by a guy who expressed the Trinity in a blasphemous way that was quite insulting to the Trinity as revealed in the Bible. Okay? Okay. It is blasphemous. And this guy says, oh, I, I, that was a good example of the Trinity. Man, you need to repent, brother. Honestly. You need to repent. Don't ever repeat that. Not in my presence anyway. If you want to repeat it someone else? Fine. Don't ever repeat that. Anyway, you with me there? You guys following? Did you understand why we get confused? Well, how can God be one God and three persons? Because you're thinking from your frame of reference as a creature limited to time, space, and place. In which, in your creature creatureliness, in this created order, you don't see a being that's more than one person. So in your mind, if God is one being, he's got to be one person. So you're telling me God is one being, then he's got to be one person. And you forget that may be true of creation. That may be true, true of the created order. That may be true of the created realm. But God has told us, he is not identical to creation. He transcends creation. He's unlike creation. So there may be things that are similar to God, analogous to God, but there's nothing identical to God in creation. So don't assume what God can and cannot be just because a creature can't be one being in more than one person. Don't challenge me where God says that unless you're asking sincerely. If you're asking since then, Ender, I will show you. But if you're stupid enough to challenge me, I will block you. Are you asking sincerely? Uh, because I'm about to show that from the Bible. Oh, okay, Ender. I thought you're challenging me. Be patient, brother. Ender, be patient. I'll show you, brother. If you're asking sincerely, I'll, I'll answer. Just be patient. I'm getting there. So, guys, wait. I'm going to get there. But I can't go fast if I'm going to lose you. So did everyone understand the difference between being and person? Did everyone understand that not every being is a person? And everyone understand that go though God is one being, that doesn't mean for God to be one being, he can only be one person. Okay? Mods, be quick on these demons of, of Muhammad, these satanic dogs coming in. Get rid of them quick because I see them faster than you do. By the way, it is not necessarily true that even in creation, if you're one being, you're more than one person. Okay? That's not necessarily true. Because even in creation, you find what we consider defects, abnormalities. For example, Siamese twins. That's an abnormality. That's a defect. Right? But a Siamese twin, it's two persons that have one being. Right? Right? But that's not an analogy to the Trinity. That is not an analogy to the Trinity because that's an abnorm abnormality. That's an abnormality. That's a defect. 
right? But they come up possessing the same being. And oftentimes when you try to split them, they die. No, and a personality disorder, that's a disorder reverse. So yes, you can have a person that has multiple personalities, but that's not normal. That's an abnormal abnormality. So that's why they cannot serve as analogies to God. Because a healthy human being is one being, one person. If you're more than one person, or if you have multiple personalities, that's a disorder, that's a defect, that's an abnorma abnormality. As the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue, right? Abnormality. It's not normal. What's the point? Let me repeat like a broken record. And I'm hoping Marcy is getting this. And I'm hoping Louisa, the new faces are getting it. Those of you who've been around, you already know this. I'm preaching to the choir. But help me to help you. Please don't pontificate. Just listen. Focus. Ask questions if you're getting confused, if they're sincere questions. All right. So one being, three persons. If someone says, well, how can God be one being more than one person? Look, you're one being one person. Last time I checked, God is not a human being. So why are you now <clears throat> demoting God to the level of human existence when you believe God transcends all created exist existence, God transcends creatureliness. He's unlike creation. Now, let me give you the biblical evidence for it. Okay, Muslim Abdullah, are you that coward that I challenge to debate me on Discord? If it's you, because you come under different nicks, like your prophet, you're ashamed of your identity as a Muslim. I don't blame you. I'm ashamed for you. Are you that Mohammedan? Let me know because I'm going to take five minutes to expose your prophet as a son of Satan with John 20, 17. You ready, Muslim Abdullah? You ready? Come on now. Quick. If not, we're going to have to meet later in Discord so I can barbecue you and send you to Mecca. Is that you? Okay, stick around because I'm going to barbecue you on Discord and send you to Mecca. Unless you want me to give you a five-minute version and embarrass you and send you on your merry way. What do you want? You want the five minute version, Muslim of Allah, to show you how this verse proves that your prophet is the son of Satan? Don't don't go anywhere, guys. Enjoy this. This is live. We'll kill several birds with one stone. Okay, you want me to go on with my session or show you how John twenty seventeen proves that your prophet is the son of Satan? He's the antichrist, and he's damned by Jesus to hell. What do you want me to do? Use that passage to show you that Muhammad is a fake, or do you want me to continue with my session and then get to you later on Discord? Because I aim to please. I aim to please. Hold on, let's see what he wants. Because I challenge him to show up on Discord. So guys, after this session, show up on Discord because I'm going to barbecue him by the grace of Jesus. And in love, I'll do it in love. I'll be very loving in barbecuing him and exposing his prophet as a son of Satan. Very loving. Where is the love? Hey, Bob the Builder, I love you, bro. But man, chill, bro. Let me do what I need to do. Don't be telling me what to do. When I come on your channel, I'm going to tell you what to do. Where is the love you've been dreaming of? All right. Okay, guys, let's focus. Now, let me show you that the Bible says God is unlike anything in creation. You can't liken him to creation. There's nothing equal to him in creation. He transcends creatureliness. And he's beyond your ability to fully comprehend. Are you ready? Are you ready? It may be Bob the Builder or someone that works for Bob the Builder. Are you ready now? Let me now prove to you from Scripture that God says, I'm unlike anything in creation. Listen. Unlike anything in creation, I transcend creation. There's nothing in creation that's equal to me. And I'm above and beyond your ability to fully comprehend. Are you ready for that now? Are you ready for that? Folks, you're going to have to make this your go-to session on the doctrine of the Trinity. Instead of asking me, go back, re-listen to it, and re-re-listen to it until it becomes second nature. And now no one can refute you when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity because the Bible led Christians to formulate the doctrine. This teaching was developed because the Bible forced us to come up with something to make sense out of the Bible. All right? I don't know what Muslim Abdullah said. Does he want me to barbecue him? Now I will. Okay, now let's begin. We ready in Jesus' name.
Job chapter 5, verse 9. Job chapter 5, verse 9. Focus, folks. Job 5, verse 9. Here's where I need you to listen now. Okay, Mickey Afrata, I will do it right after this. Okay, Muslim Abdullah, wait. Give me a few moments. Which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Point number one. Here we're told an inspired book of scripture. God does great things that are unsearchable, marvelous things without number, cannot be counted. You can't search them out. You can't count them. They transcend your ability to do so. Job chapter 9, verse 10. Focus, guys. As the Holy Spirit enables me to recall these passages to glorify the triune God. Job 9, verse 10. I'll do it in a minute. Hold on. Abdullah, don't run to the black stone. Just wait. Let me finish this. I promise you. On a live session, I'll embarrass you and your prophet. And I'll do it in love. Job 9, verse 10. Which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. How many times will the Bible need to repeat the things that God does are beyond comprehension, past find, finding out, and he's higher than you. His thoughts are higher than yours, and his ways are higher than yours. But pay attention to how many times he's going to say it. Pay attention to how many times he's going to say this in inspired scripture. Job 11, verses 7 to 9. Job 11, verses 7 to 9. Job 11, verses 7 to 9. Include also, for, uh, include also verse 10. Include also verse 10. Canst thou by searching find out God? These are rhetorical questions. The answer is no. Can you search out God and find him? No. Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Can you perfectly figure out and discover the depth of God? No. Pay attention. Okay. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Can you reach heaven? Deeper than Sheol, hell. What canst thou know? Can you comprehend that? Right? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Right? If he cut off and shut up, right, <clears throat> or gather together, then who can hinder him? You understand what you just read? Job 11, 7 to 10. Can you find out God, plumb the depths of God completely, perfectly? The depths of God higher than heaven. Can you reach heaven? No, you can't. So you, you think you're going to reach God? Deeper than Sheol, hell. So can you plumb in the depths of Sheol? No, you can't. So why do you think you can plumb the depths of God? Why do you think you can find the depths of God and understand the deep things of God perfectly? Are you out of your mind? Everyone got getting this, right? Pay attention. Pay attention. Do not get into side talks or uh, in tangents. Focus, because this is important. This is your doctrine. Job 36, 26. Job 36, 26. Job 36, 26. Watch here. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. Man, he is too great for us to know him intimately and completely. Guys, etch that. In your Bibles, on your walls, in your heart, your mind. He's too great for us to know him inside and out. Okay? Job 37, verses 4 and 5. Job 37, verses 4 and 5. Adrian, my brother from a different mother. Why are you still on the tangent of Islam? Do you even care about the doctrine of Trinity, brother? Why are you talking about Islam, bro? Job 37, verses 4 to 5. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of the excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelous, marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. If the deeds of God are beyond comprehension, how much more the nature of God? Come on, mods, quickly and bouncing people. Yep, Bob, and I'm an equal opportunist. I'll be tough with you and love. And Bob is one to talk. Have you seen how he treats them? You see? Ali Dawa said that he likes to masturbate. Did you hear that, folks? With his English accent. Okay.
Adrian, brother, are you challenging me right now, my brother? Adrian, you just got done emailing me. Are you challenging me, bro? You just said, by the Holy Spirit, you can know the deep things of God. No, you can't. You can know the things of God, but you can't have full comprehension. What the Bible means is, even though you can't comprehend, it's the Holy Spirit who enables you to still believe the things that are beyond comprehension. Adrian, why are you pontificating, brother? Why are you now insulting me? I just want to understand where he's coming from. Earlier, he just got done talking about wanting to support the mystery, and now he's pontificating, talking about Islam, and now trying to correct me by saying we can understand the depths of the of God by the Holy Spirit. No, you can't. No, you can't. You're misquoting, misunderstanding 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 to 16. That's not what Paul, okay, Adrian, brother, I'm sorry, man. God bless you, buddy. Okay, you guys, you know what to do, right? Thank you. I don't need your support. You can go somewhere else, brother. Go. God bless you. Send him out of here, please. Okay. Okay, let's pay attention now. All right, folks. Everyone got it? Now, let's go to the psalmist. Is anyone comparable to God, comparable to God? Can you liken God to anything? And can God be comprehended? Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Guys, have you noticed how many distractions today, unlike yesterday? Because you see how important this doctrine is? We're getting distracted left and right, even by Christians who should know better. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Okay. To the chief musician, a psalm of David... O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest, man, the King James, the old English on my list. Ooh. Thou encompass me, encircles my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Pay attention here, right? For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Jehovah, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind. And before, you have encircled me. You've surrounded me. You're before me. You're behind me. Wherever I go, you're there. It is high. I cannot attain it. It is high. I cannot attain it. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Notice verse 6 again. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Ron Hare, who are you talking about, brother? Talking to me, Ron? You with me there? Did you catch it? Verse 6? Did you see what it said? I cannot attain the full comprehension of how God is able to know what I'm about to say before I say it. I cannot fully comprehend how God encompasses me so he's before me behind me alongside me above me are you with me there you, you okay how many more passages do we need to read until it sinks in god is unlike you he's high above creatureliness He's not bound or limited by the things that creatures are bound and limited. He exists in a completely different manner from the way we exist. His ways are beyond comprehending, let alone his essence. Okay? Psalm 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. Watch how many times he repeats this over and over and over and over and over again. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord Jehovah and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. No, that means you can't search it. No, no. Unsearchable. Guys, he's too great for you to fully comprehend. You can see he's great. You can see he's a trinity, but you won't fully comprehend how he can be a trinity, how he can know a word on my tongue before it comes out of my mouth. How? I, I see that's what the Bible says. So, God, I know that you know my thoughts. You know my desires. You know the word on my tongue. But how are you able to know that about every creature? You know every thought, every desire, every word, 
that's going to come out of the mouth of every creature that exists in the entire created order. How? I don't know how. I see that's what the Bible says. I believe it, but I can't understand how you're able to do that. This is why I'm trying to uh, correct Adrian, but he's above correction, right? He's above correction. He wanted to pontificate. It is the Holy Spirit that will enable someone like Muhammad to see God is triune, though he can't comprehend it. So yes, you'll see he's a trinity. Yes, you'll see he's above beyond comprehension. You won't understand how that's possible, how a being could eternally exist who's timeless, immaterial, spaceless, incorporeal, and yet that being exists. How then he could create time and space and place and interact with time and space and place without being bound to it? How does that work? I don't know, but the Bible tells me that's who God is and it works for him fine, though I can't understand it, but I believe it. You're right? You, you get the point? Psalm 89, 5 to 8. Psalm 89, 5 to 8. Okay, read with me, guys. Pay attention. Psalm 89, 5 to 8. Don't worry, I'm going to barbecue Muhammad Abdullah and his prophet. Just wait. Be patient. I'm patient. He's going to cry after I'm done. Just be patient. We're going to have it recorded too. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Jehovah, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto Jehovah? Okay. Who among the angelic creatures can be compared to Jehovah? Answer, no one. Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto Jehovah? Answer, no one. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be hel held in reverence of all them that are about him. O Jehovah, God of hosts, who is strong? Who is a strong Jehovah like unto thee? No one. Or to thy faithless throne about thee. Okay, you understand this now? There is no heavenly creature that is comparable to God. God is incomparable, incomparable. No angel is like God, is identical to God. Do you think human beings are? If spirit creatures, angelic creatures, do not compare to God, they don't come close to comparing to God. God transcends them. You're going to tell me then that they're human beings who exist in the way God exists, whose existence is comparable to God? Are you getting it now? Is it sinking in? God's mode of existence transcends the existence of the created order, the created realm. You cannot tell me what God can and cannot be just because a creature can't be that. Just because a human creature can only be one being and one person at the same time doesn't mean that's true of God. You get the point. You understand? You get the point now? That doesn't transfer over to God. So when someone tells you, how can he be one being and three persons? That's three gods, according to you. Well, look, you're one being and one person. I'm one being and one person. That's two beings. See? Oh, I didn't know that God was a human being like you. I didn't know that his existence was limited like you. I didn't know that creatures exist in a manner that's identical to the way that God exists. Oh, sorry. But I thought you Muslims say that there's nothing comparable to Allah. Don't you always quote chapter 42, verse 11? And there's nothing comparable to him? And chapter 1, verse 12, verse 4? But in order for your argument to work, Muhammadin, Abdul, potato, potato, that means Allah exists identical, identically to the way you exist, potato, Hello, potato. There's more. Psalm 86, verses 8 to 10. Psalm 86, verses 8 to 10. Hello, and by the way, I'm quoting CP, Christian Prince, my hero. Islam's worst nightmare on social media. Christian Prince, God bless him and preserve him for the glory of Christ. Eden, no, you're going to get blocked for giving me modalism. Eden, you want to go? You want me to send you back to your apostate church? No. God is not like you, a father and a son and a brother. That's modalism, you heretic. Anyway, Psalm 89, Psalm 86, 8 to 10. Psalm 86, 8 to 10. 
sent Eden back to the Garden of Eden to slither like her father did. Okay. Psalm 86, 8 to 10. Among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Guys, pay attention. Among the gods, there are none like thee, O Lord. Pay attention, folks. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. Number one, there's no one that exists like you, that's comparable to you, and no one can do the works that you do and the way you do them. Pay attention. No so-called God exists like you, and no so-called God can do the works that you do. Not even angels can do the works that you do and the way you do them. You see how many passages I cited to hammer this point on? God, the way he exists, the way he thinks, the way he speaks, the way he acts, no one acts like God in the way that God does, does things the way God does them, thinks the way God thinks. Nobody, no one, nada, zip. Okay. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Everyone got it? My own mod, man, I love my mod. I said, guys, do me a favor. One of the rules, don't post things for me to help me. Hey, Riaz, why did you post that, brother, when you're a mod and you know the rules? Okay. Okay, guys, let's go to Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. The demons are manifesting because we're glorifying the trying God and Satan is upset and his children are coming in droves. He's even tempting Christians who know better to distract me. Christians who should know better to distract me, like Riaz Qureshi. God have mercy on us. Lord Jesus, bless us to love each other. The way we're supposed to. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Jehovah. Let me repeat it again. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let me repeat. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Could the Bible be any clearer? I don't think like you, so don't impose your thoughts on me. I don't do things the way you do them, so don't impose your limitations on me. Could it be any clearer, folks? Did you count how many verses I gave you? Marcy here? Louisa? Because I want the newbies to benefit. In Jesus' name, may you rebuke the distractions and stay focused. As long as you're focused and you're learning, I'll be rejoicing with you in the spirit. It's like a broken record, right? Repeating it over and over and over and over again, right? We got a couple more from Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verses 17 to 18, specifically verse 18. Isaiah 40, verses 17 to 18, specifically verse 18. Over and over and over again, like, like a broken record. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto me, unto him? Okay, so can you compare God to anything? Can you make an image that's that perfectly captures God's being and mode of existence? Is he comparable to anything according to what you just read? Can anything be likened to him? Is there anything identical to him in the way he exists, the mode of existence? You saw that, right? Luis and everyone else, you saw that? Now here is where you should get blown away. Psalm, I'm sorry, Isaiah 40, verses 25 to 26. Isaiah 40, verses 25 to 26. Watch this. To whom then will you liken me, or who, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Well, God, I'm going to liken you to a human being. 
See, a human being can be only one being, one person, so you can only be one being, one person. Maybe I wasn't clear. To whom then will you liken me? Oh, I'm sorry. That's a rhetorical question means there's no one that's like you, comparable to you. Oh, okay. Now, 26. Lift up your eyes, eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one fa faileth. Did you see what he just said? You see the host, the stars? All these stars, I known them by name. I created them and I named them. Each one has a name known to me. Do you know of anyone that knows all the stars, how many stars there are and all their names? I do. Me. Me. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5. I know each star, these billions of galaxies with billion stars, I created them one by one, and I have a name for every one of them. When you can name all the stars and tell me how many they are, then you can compare yourself to me. Psalm 147, 4 to 5. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite, guys. I can stop there and say, see, you see, God transcends all creation, is unlike all creation. He transcends created <clears throat> categories. He transcends creatureliness, creaturely limitations. So there's nothing in creation that's identical to him to then tell me, well, God can't be one being and more than one person. He's got to be three gods. Why is that? Look, you're one being, one person. Oh, really? And that's your argument and proof that God can't be three persons in one? That's your argument and proof that God cannot be one being, three persons, three persons, one being, because there's nothing in creation that's one being more than one person? So you see, once you know the biblical basis, okay, once you know the biblical basis for the Trinity and the biblical foundation for the doctrine of the Trinity, there are no good arguments, no truthful arguments, no honest arguments to refute the glorious triune God. Once you know the biblical foundation for the Trinity, and the biblical basis for the doctrine of the Trinity, it's irrefutable. You're going to laugh. Because every argument set against God is going to liken God to cre a creature, demote God to the existence of a creature, impose on God creatureliness, creaturely limitations in order to deny the Trinity. Right? And someone says, well, it doesn't make sense to me. Wait, 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 wait. God has to be sensible to you for you to believe he's God. But there are doctrines or certain characteristics of God that you don't comprehend, but you don't deny. So then why don't you go all the way and be consistent and deny everything about God that you can't comprehend? Then you end up with something that's no God. You're going to end up with someone like you in your own image. So even that argument, it doesn't make sense. Well, God just told you, hey. You won't be able to figure me out. You won't be able to fully comprehend me. I will blow your mind away. I'm beyond your comprehension. So you, you can see that God is a trinity, but you won't be able to comprehend that. That's actually an argument for the trinity being true. Let me repeat it again. This is actually an argument for the trinity being true. Because why? A, God is incomprehensible, beyond our ability to fully comprehend, beyond our ability to fully understand. And his existence is unlike anything in creation. B, the Trinity is incomprehensible, beyond our ability to fully comprehend, beyond our ability to understand, and it's unlike anything in creation. C, the Trinity must be a true revelation of who God is. Making sense? I don't know if I got Louisa and Marcy with me. I hope I didn't lose them. So you see how the Trinity actually 
perfectly <clears throat> comports to what the Bible says about God. The Bible says God is beyond comprehension. We can't fully understand, unlike anything creation. Well, the Trinity is beyond comprehension. We can't fully understand it, unlike anything in creation. So that actually is proof for the Trinity being true, not an objection against his truthfulness. So Mary, you're getting this, Mary, my precious sister in the Lord? And Louisa, you're getting it? It's okay, Louisa. You can go back. I just want to make sure you're getting it. This will be the go-to session for you guys to re-listen, re-re-listen, and pass it on. Once you understand the doctrine of the Trinity, all you need to do is now prove the Trinity from Scripture. The only thing you need to do now is show where the Bible says the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. The Father is not the same person as the Son and the Spirit. The Son is not the same person as the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit is not the same person as the Father and the Son. Voila! There you go, the Trinity. Now let me show you what the New Testament says. Philippians 4, verse 7. Philippians 4, verse 7. And I'm going to bring in the Quran as added ammunition for you Christians witnessing the Muslims to silence them. Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Wait, 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 wait. Guys, let's post that one more time. Uh, mimeophobe, that Muslim is an ignoramus or a liar and deceiver. Who told you when God created man in his own image, he was one person? That means you haven't read the Bible. Because when it says, let us make Adam in our image, it says male and female. They were two persons, not one. Bam, in your face, Muhammad. Now, Philippians 4, 7, pay attention. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Folks, can I ask you a question? God's peace is just one of many attributes that God possesses. Because God is also loving. He's also holy. Folks, please help me understand. If this peace of God, this one attribute among many attributes of God, is beyond comprehension... God's characteristic attribute of peace is beyond comprehension. How much more should we expect God to be beyond comprehension when we then meditate on his totality and fullness? If a single attribute of God, his peace is beyond comprehension, how much more in all his fullness, how much more the totality of God will be beyond comprehension? Yeah, but only one thing, Anna. You're one person with a mind, logic, and spirit, and God is not one person. That's why I said analogies break down, nothing identical to God. Right? You're still one person, right? You have a mind, logic, and spirit. Does that make you three persons? But God is not one person. That's why every analogy breaks down. So we can't press analogies. So do you understand how powerful Philippians 4, 7 is? Their relationships to one another, their interaction with one another, their love for one another, that the one sends the others and the others are sent and they obey. That's why we know they're personally distinct, forgiven. Does the father speak to the son? Does the son speak to the father? Does the father and the son speak to the spirit? Unless you believe God is a ventriloquist, and deceiving us into thinking he's more than one person, then the language of Scripture is clear. The Father cannot be the Son if the Father is loving the Son, and the Son cannot be the Father if the Son is loving the Father, and the Spirit cannot be the Father and Son if the Father and the Son send the Spirit and instruct the Spirit. Send stupid monkey on a stupid way. Come on, at mods, fast. Okay. Now Ephesians three seventeen to nineteen. Ephesians three seventeen to nineteen. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, may be, ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now notice the paradox here. The paradox here. Watch here. 
may be able to comprehend with all saints. Notice the paradox. I want you by the Holy Spirit to comprehend this. Comprehend what, Paul? And all the saints, I want you to comprehend this. What is the breadth and length, depth, height, and to know the love of God, which passeth all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wait, 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 wait. The love of Christ is beyond our ability to know completely? Yeah, and I want you to try your hardest to comprehend what is incomprehensible. That's a paradox, Paul. You just said it's beyond knowledge. Yes, but that should be an incentive to try to plunge the depth of Christ's love because you'll never be able to fully understand and know it. So don't stop growing in that knowledge, growing in that love, growing in your comprehension of just how much Jesus loves you because once you think you get it, you still didn't get it because the depth of his love for you defies understanding, defies language, defies logic. Okay, now, let me ask you a question again. If Jesus' characteristic and attribute of love, one attribute of Jesus, his love, is beyond knowledge, beyond comprehension, how much more should you expect Christ to be <clears throat> incomprehensible to you beyond your capacity fully comprehend when you meditate on him in all his fullness and totality how much incomprehensible is christ in all his fullness and totality if a single attribute of his is beyond your ability to fully comprehend and by the way folks this proves that jesus must be god you know why? Because you cannot say this of the love of a creature. Paul says the love of Christ is beyond knowledge, surpasses our ability to know. You cannot say that of a creature. It is only God's love and the love of God alone that's incomprehensible. So why would Paul say this about the love of Christ if Christ is a mere creature? Everyone got that? Everyone got it. I have now explained the doctrine of the Trinity, what it is and what is what it isn't. And I've shown you from scripture, God's mode of existence is being is infinitely greater than the existence of creation. His mode of being transcends creatureliness creaturely limitations, so that the one eternal infinite being of God can't eternally exist in three persons. And I explained what I meant by person and what I didn't mean. So that to say, well, God can't be one being and three persons, three persons fully possessing that one being. Why can't he? Oh, because there's nothing like that in creation. Thank you for proving that the Trinity must be true because the Bible tells us God is beyond comprehension incomparable, incomparable, nothing compares to the way he exists, nothing compares to the way God thinks and acts and speaks, and the Trinity is incomprehensible, incomparable, it's unlike anything in creation. You just made a case that the Trinity must be true. Bye-bye, hasta la vista, arrivederci. Oh, mare, oh, oh, cantare, oh. You got it? So what you now need to do, you got the definition and you got the biblical basis to expect that God's mode of existence will be unlike anything creation, infinitely greater and more compli complex than creation, beyond your ability to fully understand and comprehend how his existence can be, but it is. There are many things in creation that even scientists cannot fully comprehend, but they know are realities nonetheless. And that's in creation. If even creation with its limitation is beyond our ability to fully comprehend, how much more the creator who is greater than his creation? Right? Let me repeat that again. Even the brightest minds, scientists, will tell you there are things in creation we know are realities, but we can't understand how they function this way. 
and how they exist in this mode, but we know they do because we see it. It's run our eyes. We don't have the answer. Well, if that's true with the creation, as limited as it is in contrast to the creator, you want the creator to be more comprehensible and less complex? So enough with the nonsense that God can't be a trinity. Why can't he? Well, it doesn't make sense to me. Last time I checked, making sense to you is not a prerequisite for it to be true. Right? Well, there's nothing like God in creation. Last time I checked, there can't be anything like God in creation. So thank you for making an argument that the trinity is true. Is that making sense? Exactly. Isaac, I'm hot-tempered because that's my passion. If you want someone who's passionless and academic, go listen to William Lane Craig. I'm not going to be here with one hand behind me. The Bible says, and the hypostatic union, and on the molecular level, and you, you want that? There are people who talk that way. When I talk about the God that I love and I'm in love with, and to my shame, I love him imperfectly and, and fail him, you better believe I'm going to get excited and be filled with passion. And it's not a show. When I talk about things I love, I get passionate. And if you're not passionate about the triune God, then you should go bury yourself. Go bury yourself. You're a disgrace to, to the Trinity. Sorry. But if you want me to be a, a scholarly, yeah, boys and girls, open up to your textbook on page 26. We're going to read about the molecular structure. And we're going to read about the nucleus. And yes, the prophet Isaiah did say that God is beyond comprehension. Yes, oh yeah, that means you can't comprehend. Oh, it's recess time. Let me say it again. You don't like it? Get lost. Get out of here. I don't want people like you here. I'm not looking for people who are going to criticize the way someone has been designed to speak. What's up, Mike? What's dude? Oh, my gosh. You don't like that? I will, here I go again. I'm very articulate. In fact, next time I'm going to wear glasses so I can look even more smart. All right. Okay. With that said, it's okay, Greg. You can. That's the beautiful thing. That's the beautiful thing about these sessions. You're going to get comedy relief. You're going to get... <clears throat> Anger, you're going to get insults, you're going to get <clears throat> encouragement, you're going to get your ego destroyed, all in one session, free of charge, because I love you. Okay, now everyone with me now? Everyone got it? Because hey, that's what they want. Some of these poor Christian brothers and sisters have gone to these universities where the professors are glasses, class. Yes, open your textbook to page 209. We're going to talk about the nucleus and on a molecular level how it functions. And class, we have to be monotone about it. Don't get too excited. All right. Do you actually think, now be honest with me, do you actually think when the apostles preached and they went to the synagogue, that's how they spoke, that when Paul entered a synagogue, he would say, uh, Rabbi? Can you give me that scroll of Isaiah 53? By his wounds we are healed. And the peace that and the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And he was buried with the wicked and in the rich with his grave. Oh, and by the way, that's Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. You think that's what caused riots? You think that's what caused Paul to get stoned, beat, thrown out of synagogues, chased out of cities and towns and villages, running for his life? You think that's honest? I mean, be honest with me. Do you think he sat on a studio and said, uh, on a stage? And yes, the preponderance of the evidence points to the likelihood that Jesus is God. You know, you know, I have good reasons to think Jesus is God. And I have better reasons to think Isaiah 53 is not about Messiah. It's about Israel. But, you know, your points, you have some valid points, but I think I made a stronger case. Okay, we honestly, do you actually think that's how the apostles preach? I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. No, I mean, be honest with me. Honest. 
Just read through the book of Acts. The apostles got beat, they got whipped, they got stoned, they got imprisoned, and they had to run from city to city. That sure sounds like they had my temperament. They had the temperament of Sahih Christian, who was a Syrian. They had the temperament of a Christian prince. Let's be honest. Who resembles the apostles in the way they preach? Christian prince? Sai Christian? Me? Or these? And I'm not putting them down. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. But these academics saying, yes, the preponderance of evidence seems to point to the most likelihood that Jesus is God. And Isaiah 53 most likely is him. What do you think? Oh, those are strong points. But I think I made a more persuasive case. And let's go have dinner. How many people do you think Paul had dinner with, dinner with after he finished? Preaching a sermon how Jesus is the Messiah in the synagogue. How many rabbis say, hey, Paul, you know what? We still don't agree, but hey, man, let's go have dinner on me, my treat, at the local Greek Athenian bar. Come on, man. Honestly. This is what I call the sissification and the feminization of Western Christians. The sissification, the feminization of, I don't want to say it's white, it's not just white, of Western Christianity. Like a dear brother in Christ and a theologian that I respected, Robert Moore used to say, Evan Jellyfishes, Evan Jellyfishes. That is all love. Jesus loves you. Jesus lo Okay, now with that said, folks, I promise you, if you re-listen and re-re-listen to the session, you now know what the doctrine of the Trinity is, what it entails, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and the biblical basis to show that you should expect that God's existence is infinitely greater than ours. His mode of existence is unlike creaturely existence, right? And that creatureliness and the mode in which creatures exist cannot be likened or compared to God's mode of existence. Because his mode of existence is not limited or bound in the same way that creaturely existence is bound and limited. You got ample evidence for that point. What you need to do from now on is now go to the Bible to show there is one God and the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and they're not the same person. How do we know? Because they interact with one another. They love one another. They have fellowship with one another. And one sends the others and instructs the others, and the others are sent and obey. Right? These are the biblical foundations for the doctrine of the Trinity. So though the language of the Trinity, the language used to come up with the doctrine of the Trinity is not found in the Bible, what the language points to is taught in the Bible. So let me make a distinction. The language of the doctrine of the Trinity is not found in the Bible. But what the language is meant to convey and teach is solidly taught in the Bible, the Word of God. Clear? Nope, I'm not, Isaac. I'd love to come and start riots there. Now, let me use two Quranic verses against Muslims who may be ignorant or even dishonest or stupid enough to try to use our mode of existence to limit God and deny that he can be triune. Chapter 42, verse 11 of the Quran. Chapter 42, verse 11 of the Quran. And folks, if you want, I'll take a minute to send you articles where I school a Muslim Dawagandist polemicist who thank Jesus has retired from writing polemics and rebuttals, right? He's returned to his black stone, Bassam Zawadi, where we went at it, a written debate, because at that time there was no YouTube, where I utterly embarrassed him because he made the stupid mistake, the stupid mistake in his debates and in his written rebuttals to say, see, you're one being one person. He said that in a debate, and I nailed him. I embarrassed him. You're one person, one being. I'm one person and one being. So Allah is one person, one being. I nailed him and I embarrassed him. And he didn't know what to say. And he had no comeback in my written rebuttals. Chapter 42, verse 11. Chapter 42, verse 11. And if you want the articles, I'll send them to you. 
And if Muhammad Abdullah is here, we can now debate him and send him on his merry way, unless he ran. Chapter 42, verse 11. The creator of the heavens and the earth, he hath made for you pairs of yourselves and of the cattle also pairs, whereby he multiplieth you. Not it as his likeness. Brother, can you do me a favor? Can you give me something in plain English? The King James is fine because I love the King James and I believe it's God's perfect words in English. That's my conviction. So I'll tolerate this Shakespearean language and try to adapt to it. But why do you have to give me a King James style Quran when you know I have a bad lisp? Can you give me in plain English, brother? Faith Love, I have dozens of YouTube sessions and articles discussing that. But in the future, I will teach those doctrines again and again and again. Chapter 42, verse 11. The originator of the heavens and the earth. He made mates for you from among yourselves and mates of the cattle too, multiplying you thereby. Nothing like a likeness of him. Let me repeat. The Quran agrees. Nothing like a likeness of him. He is the hearing, the seeing. So the Quran says there is no likeness to Allah. You can't imagine Allah or attribute a likeness to him. Chapter 112, verse 4. Chapter 112, verse 4 of the Quran. Chapter 112, verse 4. Thank you for the Arabic. Okay. And none is like him. None is like him. Okay, Muslim. Why can't God be one being in three persons? And it's in my rebuttals. Basam Zamari made the stupid mistake. It was like almost God handing him to me on a platter. You're one being in one person. I'm one being in one person. So God has to be one being in one person. And in my article, I said, you just committed shirk. Shirk is the one sin that the Quran says Allah will not forgive if it's done with consent and understanding. And here's a form of shirk. I don't know if you know this. When you liken Allah to a creature, you are committing shirk because you're saying there's a creature who can be likened to Allah, who's comparable to Allah. That's shirk. Now, let me show you where the Quran says shirk will never be forgiven. Chapter 4, verse 48 of the Quran and chapter 4, verse 116. Chapter 4, verse 48 of the Quran and chapter 4, verse 116. Okay. Okay. Chapter 4, verse 48. Pay attention, guys. Surely Allah does not forgive that anything should be associated with him. The, in Arabic, that's shirk. The word shirk, S-H-I-R-K, means to associate. Allah will not forgive shirk when you associate anything with him and forgives what is besides that to whomsoever he pleases. And whoever associates anything with Allah, he devises indeed a great sin. So according to the Quran, if you associate, ascribe partners with Allah, that's the sin of shirk. It will not be forgiven. And he repeats it again. This false god who inspired Muhammad, which was an evil spirit of not Satan, he repeats it again in 4116. Surely Allah does not forgive that anything should be associated with him, and he forgives what is besides this to whom he pleases, and whoever associates anything with Allah, he indeed strays off into remote error. According, according to Islamic theology, to liken Allah to a creature is to make a creature comparable to Allah, to ascribe likeness to Allah, and that's a form of shirk. I nailed Basam Zawani, and I hope he watches this to a shame and embarrassment, so the Spirit shames him enough to repent and give up on his false prophet and worship Jesus, Muhammad's God and judge, his only hope of salvation, in my written rebuttals, and he went silent after that. I said, you just committed shirk because you said, Allah can't be one being in more than one person because we... we are one being one person, you liken Allah to a creature, you liken the existence of a creature to Allah, you just condemn yourself, Basam Zawari. Good job, my friend. Good job, my friend. I'm going to get you the articles before I shut down because I'm going to give you a final example of how a Muslim embarrassed himself in a live debate. I believe it was around 2000 or 2001. 
It was a mosque in Detroit, Michigan. There was a seminary student, a Christian. I forgot his name. I hope he's listening to me because if he, if he is listening to me, he can confirm this. Every month, they would meet at a mosque and they would have dialogues on Christianity. And the Muslims, for the most part, would tear them up, would tear them to shreds because they thought they had to be nice and they had to be loving and couldn't be offensive. And this guy got really fed up. And now, previous sessions, they would record. Now, he invited me, could you come and debate on the Trinity? I go, sure. And I debated an Ahmad Didat wannabe. Glory to the triumph God. At this time, people didn't know me, and the website wasn't that famous. It was like 2000, 2001. The website hadn't spread. So the infamy of answeringislam.net wasn't known. So I show up out of nowhere. They don't know who I am. You got a couple who had converted to Islam, a Caucasian couple, a white couple who became Muslim. Glory to the triumph God. They got decimated. They were annihilated. They didn't know what hit them. They were in a state of shock. I'm not exaggerating. Glory to the triumph God. They were in a state of shock. They didn't know what hit them. They stood there and saw. In fact, the Caucasian couple got so rocked. One, the husband started like arguing very loudly. And when I shut his argument down, he became like a quiet puppy. They were in a state of shock. I'm not exaggerating. The Lord bears witness if I'm lying. But let me tell you what was the highlight of the evening for me. The highlight. You want to hear? And coincidentally, they didn't record that session. All the other sessions there were recorded. But this one wasn't recorded. And the damage was so great, they stopped the dialogues. After that session, glory to the triumph God, the Muslims stopped the dialogues. They stopped meeting with Christians. I don't remember his name. That's why I'm hoping, brother, you know who you are. If you're listening, reach out to me so you can confirm what I'm saying. But here was the highlight for me, guys. You want to hear what was the highlight for me? A Muslim professor. He's a professor, by the way. Not a professor of Islamic theology. Professor at some school, right? He says, uh, the, it's called the fitra. In Islam, there's something called the fitra. Fitra means the natural state in which Allah has created you. They believe everyone was created in a state of Islam. Let me explain. Do you guys mind if I explain a little bit of Islamic theology to refute it and expose it for the glory of the triumph God? Fitra. Fitra. And if you guys want me to do sessions on exposing Islam, I will. We will do sessions on core doctrines of the Christian faith, why the Bible is the word of God, and how we can know it's the word of God, preserved by God. God is the Trinity. Jesus is the God-man. And also other issues related to the way we should live, you know, how we should worship by the grace of God. We're exposing cults like Joe's Witnesses, and I can do talks on exposing Islam. I can do it all. If God gives me health, holiness, and the financial provision to do it, I'll do it all until Jesus tells me stop and takes me home. Now, fitra. Fitra. Fitra is the Arabic word used to refer to the natural condition of man, the natural state of man. Muslims are taught that everyone is born in fitra. Okay, what is fitra? Now, many of you already know this. I'm preaching to the choir. Fitra means that you're all born submitting to Allah. A baby is born natural, naturally submitting because a baby is hopeless and helpless. So it's born in a state of submission, submitting to Allah and those that Allah in his mercy will raise to take care of that child. So you're born in a natural state of submission, surrendering your will, right? A baby is hopeless, helpless. It has no choice. He or she depends on the parents or someone, right? So that natural state of surrender, they call Islam. It's later that your parents then convince you, convince you to become Christian or pagan or Jew. Okay. So now with that said, the man has given me example, example that we're all born in a state of fitra. He goes, there's these group of people. I don't know if he said Aborigines. I don't want to put words in his mouth. It's been a long time. Right? They don't have TV. They don't have radio, but they know there's one God. There's one God. See, that's their natural state, their fitra. There's one God. <laughs> and yet he says to me, but no one, no one has ever come up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Pay attention, folks. 
No one has ever come up with the Trinity, but people naturally know there's one God. So notice what he said. No man left on his own has ever come up with the Trinity. So where did the Trinity come from? Ha, ha, ha. Get on his heart, right? I said, wait, wait, let me get you. Let me, let me see if I understood you correctly. I want everyone to hear it. You said no man can ever come up with the Trinity on his own. Right? Yes. So a man cannot make up the Trinity because it's not natural to man to know there's a Trinity, right? So then where did the Trinity come from? Bam! Mic drop. Where did the Trinity come from? You guys caught it? Because he just said no man can come up with the Trinity left on his own. And I made sure he repeated it. But we have the Trinity. Where did it come from? You can't say man made it because that means you just refuted yourself. You said no man can come up with the Trinity on his own. Man instinctively know there's one God. So thank you for proving the Trinity is not man made. It came as revelation from the true God. It's a birthday. Go Sammy. Go Sammy. All right. You got it? Okay, time for the articles. If that Mohammedan is here, I'll take him to Discord. Unless he wants to get roasted here. Let me get you the articles. Don't go anywhere. The one refuting some Basam Zawadi. Okay. Yeah. Just let me get you the articles. Hold on. Here it is. It's a series of articles. Save them. It's in the Basam Zawadi section. What happened here? It's acting up. Here you go. Start with here. The Trinity and God's attribute of love. Here you're going to see the roasting he got by the grace of the triune God, the Samdawadi. Okay, save that link. Click on it. Save it. But you got to study it. Pass it on to others. If you want to print it out, feel free. Upload it to your website. Keep the URL and the name intact. Don't sell it, because if you sell it, I need all the proceeds I can get for ministry. And guys, as you're as you're saving the links, don't forget to pray for my daughters. My oldest daughter, my firstborn, her birthday is Thursday. She will turn 12. Pray for a miracle for them and I, something miraculous in Jesus' name that we don't deserve for their sake, Lord. So I won't be there. Okay, that's the one. Here's another. Here's another. This is now because he tried to respond. So I responded back. Save that link, guys. And hopefully one of the mods will put it in the description box. Save that link. He got a roasting, poor guy. He didn't know what happened. Okay. Poor guy started crying. Okay. Here it is. That's three so far, but there's two more. Three so far, but there's two more. Okay. Sarai and Zipporah, my angels. Pray for their mother to repent, Michelle, and pray for Martin, her boyfriend, to be removed in Jesus' name, to stay away from my children. He must go in Jesus' name. Please, Lord. Okay, that's three. Here's two more. We're done. We're done with this. And then I'm going to give you an article I wrote on the incarnation. What does it mean for Jesus to be the God-man? What does it mean that Jesus, who's God, became man? What does that mean? You need to read this article, folks. It's must-reading, the incarnation. But first, let me get you this. Five links all together, save them, study them, pass them on. I promise you, folks, if you study the material, you'll be more than equipped, fully equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit to know the Bible is God's word. God is a trinity. Jesus is the God man. He's real. He's alive. Atheism is a lie. Islam is a lie. Joe's witnesses are a lie. And you'll be emboldened to share the good news with people. Now, let me get you the article, the article on the incarnation. Oops, sorry. And I have new articles on my blog, but I'll post them tomorrow. Lord Jesus willing, I may do a part two that will be related to the doctrine of the Trinity because I want to talk about the concepts known as monolatry and henotheism. I'll ask you guys if you want me to do that. Hold on. And then we'll go back to foreshadowings of Christ. Okay. Save these links, folks. Pray for a miracle on Thursday, my daughter's birthday. Pray God miraculously keeps me safe and planted here, keeps those corrupt, evil, legal, Demons of the devil away from me. Keep providing. 
so I can provide for my children to give me the health I need and the holiness to delight his heart. That's their article, right? I just gave you the article. I just sent you the article. This is the incarnation. I sent you five links to Basam Zawadi. Count them. And now I just sent you a link on the incarnation. You must read these articles. They will help you in Jesus' name. Now, Lord willing, I can do a part two that goes with this because there's something among Christian theologians, scholars, and apologists called henotheism in contrast to monotheism and monolatry. Okay, here are the terms. Henotheism, monotheism, and monolatry. Do you guys really want to go deep? Monolatry. Henotheism, monotheism, monolatry. Among Christians who are Trinitarians, you have two camps. You have a camp that says there's only one God, and he's triune. You have another camp says there is one eternal God who is triune, but there are other gods whom he created, lesser gods, who are weaker, whom God created, whom God sustains, whom God can destroy, and are no challenge to the true God. And only the true God who is triune is to be worshipped. So let me repeat. You have monotheism. There's only one true God in existence, the triune God. But then you have a form of Trinitarianism that says there is only one eternal almighty God, and that's the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. But the Trinity created a host of lesser gods. They're not as powerful as the Trinity. They're not eternal like the Trinity. They depend on the Trinity for their power and authority. They're subject to the Trinity, and the Trinity can wipe them out of existence in a nanosecond, right? Because they pose no threat to the Trinity, and only the Trinity is to be worshipped. That's called henotheism and monolatry. You guys want me to talk about that? Henotheism and monolatry. Do you guys want me to talk about that? Let me name a few henotheists that are Trinitarian. Mike Heiser, Michael Heiser, who is an outstanding Trinitarian evangelical scholar who's got great work, he is a henotheist. I got more ones than no. The only no I got was Anna Broang. He is a henotheist, and he holds to monolatry. Yeah, he's a henotheist. That's what you call it. Let me repeat again. Mike Heiser is a Trinitarian. He loves the Trinity. He worships the Trinity. And he knows the triumph God exists. And he's a great evangelical scholar. But he is a henotheist and he holds the monolatry. Yes, but they are henotheists of a different kind, Jesus is raised. Mormons are polytheists, not henotheists. Right? So I got enough ones that you guys want me to talk about it tomorrow, right? Medic. My brother from a different mother like no other. They'll tell you that the term God can have different shades of meaning, nuanced shades of meaning. In fact, Medic, you want me to prove it to you? They'll say, just look at your strong concordance, any concordance, and you'll see when you look for the word God, it has nuanced meanings, different shades of meaning. You want me to show that to you or you believe me? Go to your strongs or your theers. Look at the word theos or Elohim. And he'll say, say, God, Trinity, Jesus, angels, men, false gods. Okay. So I got more ones than twos. So we'll do that tomorrow, God willing. Same bad time, same bad channel. It will be around 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, Canadian time, between 5 and 6, God willing. Pray for me. This is a hard week for me. Two reasons why it's hard. Number one. My firstborn's birthday Thursday, and I won't be there, and I haven't heard from them. I'm calling them. They're not calling me. And number two, it so happened, March 12th, Thursday, on my daughter's fourth birthday, when she turned four years old, my beloved mother died and entered the presence of Jesus. So two things happened on March 12th. March 12, 2010, my two angels, the first of whom was given to me, the two greatest gifts that Jesus gave me on earth, my firstborn, my baby. My firstborn was born. But then when my firstborn turned four, on March 12, 2014, my mother entered the presence of Jesus. So it's going to be a hard week for me, folks. Pray for a miracle.
Pray for a miracle for my daughters and I, that I'll have them in my arms again. Their mother will repent and fear Jesus and stop bringing ungodly, unrepented heathens. Martin Simon Yaku doesn't believe in Jesus. May the Lord chasten him to repent and keep him away from my daughters. I love you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed. And the Trinity is real. The Trinity is reality. The Trinity is true. The Trinity lives. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is our God forever and ever. Amen. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. May the Lord Jesus come sooner than later. Maranatha. Take care.